In this video, we'll be going over the worst feats you can possibly pick up in D&D. And at number 10, we have Tavern Brawler. This feat allows you to increase your strength or constitution score by one. So it automatically earns you a whole bunch more points than a lot of the other feats on this list, which don't give you an ability score improvement. Because at least you can kind of take this feat to round out a stat, and then gain a minor benefit on top of it. So any feat which gives an ability score improvement, which are also known as ASIs, it's basically half an ASI anyway, so it won't rank very high in this list. Now, in addition to this ability score improvement, it also allows you to become proficient with improvised weapons, and used to give you proficiency in unarmed strikes as well, before they just made an errata that allowed everyone to have it baseline. So, one of the original benefits of this feat was kind of just made baseline and removed from the feat. In addition, its next feature gives you an unarmed strike that deals 1d4 damage. Normally, an unarmed strike, if you're not a monk, only deals 1 damage, plus your strength modifier. So this feat basically turns that into the same damage as a dagger, which still isn't very good. But in situations in which you can't use weapons, which do come up occasionally in D&D games, this will allow you to do significantly more damage with your unarmed attack. I should also note that improvised weapons do 1d4 damage baseline. So if you just pick up a rock or a thick piece of wood, you still don't need to do an unarmed attack. And its last feature is that if you hit a creature with an unarmed strike or an improvised weapon, you then gain the ability to use your bonus action to perform the grapple action, which allows you to use your athletics check against your opponent's athletics or acrobatics check, and if you win this contest of skill, you get to reduce their speed to zero. Now, a grapple is actually useful in a lot of situations, like preventing someone from running away or preventing them from going to the back line to attack your casters or something. Reducing the target's movement speed to zero, where they have to attempt an escape action to get away from you, is a beneficial effect to have. However, the big problem with this is that you have to use an unarmed attack or an improvised weapon in order to be able to use this bonus action. And normally, you don't want to do that, since just using a normal weapon or spell will do more damage. And this is kind of what makes this bonus action grapple kind of useless. This feat is only really useful in incredibly situational circumstances, and even then, not by that much. However, there are some ways you can maybe make use of this. The Alchemist Fire counts as an improvised weapon, and you could throw that at someone and have them burn for 1d4 fire damage each turn, and then grapple someone. Same with Vials of Acid, those deal 2d6 poison damage and count as an improvised weapon, and will allow you to grapple as a bonus action. You could also maybe argue that the Piton could be considered a finesse weapon to allow you to use it as an improvised weapon to proc sneak attack on a rogue and allow the bonus action grapple. Or you could argue that the shield counts as an improvised weapon. It could be used to deal 1d4 damage and then allow you to grapple. Going based off of Raw, the examples with Alchemist Fire and Vials of Acid work no problem, although the examples with the Piton and the shield would require a DM to be okay with it. And this is if you really want that bonus action grapple with this feat. And at number 9, we have Weapon Master. This feat allows you to increase your dexterity or strength by 1, and since it allows you to gain a stat, it automatically places ahead over a lot of the other feats on this list, even though it is by far one of the worst ones. You see, in addition to the ability score improvement, it also allows you to gain proficiency with 4 martial weapons of your choice. It also allows you to pick simple weapons, but pretty much every class is proficient in all simple weapons. Now, the usefulness of this comes in the fact that it also allows you to pick any martial weapons, including ones that aren't in the normal player's handbook. So, if you run across an exotic weapon that an NPC was using, Weapon Master could give you proficiency in it. If your DM doesn't just let you have it because it's similar to another weapon you already have proficiency with. Another use for this is if you're playing a caster who wants to use a sword or something without having to multi-class into fighter or some other class to gain those proficiencies. Weapon Master would allow you to use that sword with your proficiency bonus without having to multi-class, although it probably wouldn't be very good. That's the thing with Weapon Master. Generally, the classes that use weapons already get proficiencies in those weapons baseline, and the ones who don't have those proficiencies generally don't need them. Unless you're like a rogue who really wants proficiency in heavy crossbows. That would be one example in which you're using a weapon that your class doesn't start off proficient in. And you see, in this one particular circumstance, being able to take a plus one in your decks and being able to use heavy crossbows without multi-class is a benefit. 
and it's pretty hard to think of other ways in which you could use this to great benefit, outside of RP reasons in which you want to play a wizard who attacks things with a sword occasionally. And at number 8, we have Skulker. This is a feat which requires you to have at least 13 decks or more, and is the first feat on this list which does not give an ability score improvement. Although out of all the mediocre feats which don't have an ASI, Sulker is definitely the best of the bunch, which is why it appears so early in this video, but still makes the video for a couple of reasons that I'll detail in a bit. This feat gives you three benefits. One of them allows you to hide while in lightly obscured areas. The other allows you to not be revealed from hidden if you miss with a ranged attack, and it removes the dim light disadvantage on your perception checks. Now, let's go over these three features in detail. The first one, you can try to hide when you are lightly obscured from the creature from which you are hiding. You see, most players don't have the exact rules of hiding memorized. Neither do DMs to an extent. In order to hide, it can be done while you're in full cover, invisible, or in a heavily obscured area. And what Skulker does is it also adds that you can hide in lightly obscured areas, which most DMs would probably let you do anyway. However, there is this other ruling that most people forget, and that's that dim light counts as lightly obscured. So with this feat, if you are simply in dim light, you can use the hide action to hide from someone who's looking directly at you. And it works based on rules as written. However, funny enough, most DMs would not let you do this, because the hiding rules are very widely misunderstood, and you'd have to talk to your DM to see if they'd even allow you to use Skulker in this way. And if they did give you the okay, you'd probably start seeing a lot more torches in dark dungeons, so that creatures with dark vision would no longer have any problem seeing you. The next feature, when you're hidden from a creature and miss it with a ranged weapon attack, making the attack doesn't reveal your position. This is good for sneak attacks, surprise attacks, and assassinations as it allows you to redo them with the same advantages. So it negates a disadvantage and doesn't actually give you an advantage. And it only works for ranged attacks, and not a lot of sneaking comes from that. Generally, all the advantages of attacking from hidden are tied to melee attacks in some way. Not all of them, but even with the ranged attack sneak stuff, this doesn't really give you an advantage, it just overrules a negative. And lastly, dim light doesn't impose disadvantage on your perception checks that rely on sight. With rules as written, if you have dark vision and you're in total darkness, you technically only see as if you have dim light. So you should have disadvantage on a lot of your checks. However, this is rarely remembered or enforced, and it's a very common house rule that dark vision just straight up gives you perfect sight in darkness. People don't do this consciously, it just kind of happens because people forget. So, if you're playing an experienced group that remembers the downsides of dark vision, then you can actually gain the benefits of this feat. So, two of the three features are largely ignored by a lot of groups, and the only real benefit with the ranged attack thing is only a minor boost at best. So, this could be either really good on certain classes that can hide as a bonus action, if you're in a lot of dim light, and if your DM allows it, or it can be made useless very easily by the DM, or not be a benefit at all if they don't use the negatives of dark vision in the first place. This feat gains more benefits the closer your group follows the rules, and loses a lot of its luster the more home rules come into play. And these are pretty common ones, which is why this feat makes this list, even though it has the potential to be very good. And at number 7, we have Spell Sniper. This feat requires you to have the ability to cast at least one spell, allows you to learn a cantrip of your choice as long as it has an attack roll, and then gives you two benefits on top of this. One of them allows you to double the range of your spells that have attack rolls, and it allows your attack rolls to ignore all but full cover. And this all seems pretty good. So why does this make this as one of the worst feats list? Well, the first benefit that allows you to double the range of your spells, it's just kind of rarely useful. A vast majority of fights will happen in small rooms actually, to the point where crossbow expert feat is taken by a lot of spellcasters just so they can use spell attacks in melee range without disadvantage. The ability to snipe someone across an open field just doesn't happen very often and is actually kind of hard to simulate on a tabletop. Fights are just easier to set up if they're in a smaller enclosed space. Although, if you're trying to chase down people often, you know you're going to be fighting in huge open spaces, or you're like on city gates trying to defend it from an attacking army, then you'll get more mileage out of it. But in normal games, in normal situations, it's pretty situationally useful, as most spell attack rolls have about a 120 foot range anyway, which is more than generous for hitting pretty much anything. 
It is a lot more useful on spells with a lot shorter ranges, like maybe Ray of Frost, which only has a 60 foot range baseline, or Witch Bolt, which only has a 30 foot range. Its next ability, the one that allows you to ignore cover, this is actually pretty nice. I take Sharpshooter a lot on characters that use a bow, and that feat also has this feature for ranged weapon attacks, and I gotta tell ya, rarely does it come up. Generally, creatures don't have half or three-fourths cover, but in the few times that they do, it is nice to be able to hit them without penalties. I wouldn't take a feat just to eliminate partial cover penalties, unless I knew my DM loved to use them, but it is a nice bonus on top of other things in the feat, which Spell Sniper doesn't really have in comparison to Sharpshooter. And let's go on to the last point. It allows you to learn one cantrip that has an attack roll. You see, this is pretty good if you really want Eldritch Blast on a non-warlock, since that's one of the best attack cantrip rolls you can pick up. However, what makes Eldritch Blast good is its invocations, which requires at least two levels in Warlock to obtain. Specifically, Agonizing Blast, which lets you add your spell modifier to each bolt, or Repelling Blast, which allows your bolts to push targets away. Although there is this new feat in Unearth Arcana called Eldritch Adept, which just straight up allows you to take Eldritch Invocations without being a Warlock. So with Spell Sniper and that feat, assuming you pick Eldritch Blast, that would allow your Eldritch Blast to be as efficient as a Warlock's, assuming your spellcast modifier was also Charisma, without having to take a single level in Warlock. But the feat Magic Initiate also grants you that cantrip, as well as another cantrip and the free use of a level 1 spell per day. So if all you want is Eldritch Blast, Magic Initiate is better, since having a free use of a level 1 spell per day is more versatile and more useful, depending on which spell you pick even if it does lock you to the Warlock spells if you pick Eldritch Blast as one of your cantrips. And even then, allow you to pick another useful cantrip as well. But if all you cared about was Eldritch Blast, and you didn't want to play a Warlock, and you were planning on taking the Eldritch Adept feat as well, and playing in a game which allowed the Unearth Arcana feat, then the ability to cast it at double range and ignoring cover is a nice benefit. And at number 6, we have Dungeon Delver. This feat gives you four advantages that are only useful while inside dungeons, kind of. And since the name of the game is Dungeons and Dragons, this feature seems like it would be incredibly useful, when actually it's only normal useful in very specific types of dungeon crawl games, like if you're running Dungeon of the Mad Mage or the Tomb of Annihilation, in which case it's still kind of questionable if you'd want to take this feat or not. Now, what this feat does is it gives you advantage in searching for secret doors, it gives you advantage on saving throws to avoid traps, lets you take half damage from traps, and allows you to travel at a faster pace without penalty to your perception. Now, let's go over all of these traits. The first one, you have advantage on perception and investigation checks to detect secret doors. And only secret doors, as funny enough it doesn't let you find traps easier. That's relegated to a level 2 spell, which no one picks up because it's kinda bad. Now, advantage on looking for secret doors essentially gives you a plus 5 to your passive perception for that check, which can be useful. There's this one module I ran, which is part of a full campaign released by the people behind D&D, and there is a secret door near the entrance to a large dungeon, which has an incredibly high perception check required in order to find it. And if the party is able to find it, they can essentially skip the entire dungeon and go straight to the end. And when I ran this campaign, they obviously missed the secret door because the check was way too high for their low level. However, if someone had this feat, they probably would have been able to find that secret door and gain a huge benefit out of it. And that would have been the only time they would have gotten use out of that feat in the entire 6 plus month long campaign, as a situation like this never happened again. And generally, I wouldn't have advised taking a feat just to skip to the end of a single dungeon, as finding all the other secret rooms was not particularly difficult. The next part, the one that gives you advantage on saving throws against traps and allows you to take half damage from traps, is situationally useful as well. Here's the thing about traps. Generally, the damage they do is not a big deal. Unless you know your DM loves traps and loves to kill people with tons of traps, then his feature is much better in those cases. Although out of all the official modules and other materials I've ran and read through, traps don't really do damage a lot of the time and rarely do a significant amount of damage where having resistances to that damage would matter. And also, generally, people get caught in traps outside of combat, so it's very easy to heal up the damage you took or to even just take a short rest to spend some hit dice to heal. And rogues and barbarians basically gain the benefits of this benefit baseline anyway. 
And lastly, the fourth feature of this, which allows you to travel at a fast pace without a penalty to your perception, is generally not used very much. Most groups kind of hand wave travel, or might just have a random encounter or two and then just say you arrived, so this ruling doesn't get used very much. Where basically, if you're traveling at a fast pace, you have a lower score in your perception checks, which presumably makes it easier to not be surprised by random encounters. It's very common for people to just skip traveling or random encounters, so this last one is kind of useless most of the time. Although in a game where you're following this rule very closely, then this would allow you to travel a lot quicker while being able to have a normal passive perception, which is pretty situationally useful, just like everything else in this feat. And at number 5, we have Medium Armor Master. This feat, if you properly optimize for it, essentially allows you to have the maximum amount of AC that normal armor can provide without a penalty to your stealth checks. But this is assuming you optimize your class for it. Now let's go over what this feat does. Basically, it makes it so Medium Armor doesn't give you disadvantage on stealth checks, and it increases the benefit you gain from Dexterity to 3. In order to understand Medium Armor Master, you really have to know the ins and outs of all the three armor types. And to put it as simply as possible, Light Armor allows you to add your Dexterity modifier to your AC with no limit, at the downside of having a low starting AC. Medium Armor has a much higher starting AC, but only allows you to add two points of your Dexterity modifier to your AC, instead of an unlimited amount. And Heavy Armor has no modifiers, and only provides a high starting AC with the requirement of having a high straight score to even wear it without penalties. So, Medium Armor Master basically increases the amount of dexterity modifier you're allowed to gain, and even though the prerequisites for this feat is to only have proficiency with Medium Armor, if you want to have the full benefit of this feat, you're also going to need to have at least 16 dexterity, which is kind of the second requirement for it, and is kind of high. Now, this feat was basically made so that characters can use half plate and still be able to stealth, and that's the best medium armor you can get, which has a baseline AC of 15 and goes up to 17 under normal circumstances, and up to 18 if you have medium armor master, and a deck score of 16 or higher. The best possible heavy armor, simply called plate, provides you with 18 AC exactly if you're wearing it, and all heavy armor imposes disadvantage on stealth. You can't be a stealthy character who also wears heavy armor, unless you take this feat and have half plate, of course. So, why is this feat bad exactly? Well, light armor does not have a limit on the amount of AC it gives you from dex. So, under normal circumstances, you can max it out at plus 5 if you have a dex score of 20. The best light armor you can take is studded leather, which gives you 12 AC plus your full dex modifier. So, if you're at max dex, studded leather gives you 17 AC. And if you're at max dex and wearing half plate, you also have 17 AC. And Studded Leather doesn't give you disadvantage on Stealth Baseline. It doesn't require any kind of feat to remove penalties. So, for taking Medium Armor Master and having 20 dex, you only get one more AC over Studded Leather. And you have to give up one of your ASIs in order to get this feat, which means you would be getting to 20 dex later, and just taking two points in dex gives you a lot more benefits than one AC. And you kind of need high dex to make the most use out of medium armor master anyway. So, if you're playing a high dex character and you want to stealth, just wearing studded leather is better than taking this feat, as you're only losing out on 1 AC. However, here's where the incredible optimization of this feat comes into play. If you're playing a character where dex is their secondary highest stat, and they're able to get it to at least 16, and they don't want to get it any higher than that, and they want to stealth, then, this feat would allow them to have 3 more AC than Studded Leather, as at 16 dex, Studded Leather only gives you 15 AC, whereas Half Plate, with this feat, would give you 18. So if you're in that incredibly specific circumstance, then this feat could give you a pretty decent boost to your AC. Otherwise, it only provides a 1 AC boost and isn't really worth it. Essentially, since Heavy Armor Master is actually kind of good, it gives a plus 1 in strength that reduces all damage from non-magical weapons by 3. And since there's no minimum damage in D&D, it's possible to just not take damage with Heavy Armor Master. So it's kind of a wonder why Medium Armor Master doesn't also give a half stat when Heavy Armor Master does. But if it did, it wouldn't be half bad. And at number 4, we have Charger. Another feat which doesn't give half an ASI. And the reason for that is because this feat supposedly increases your damage. 
With this feat, if you take the dash action, you're then allowed to make a special bonus action that allows you to make one melee attack, or to use the shove action. In addition, if you move at least 10 feet in a straight line immediately before making this bonus action, you can add 5 bonus damage to the attack if it hits, or push the target up to 10 feet away from you if you choose to take the shove action instead. Now, this bonus damage only applies to the final damage roll, and doesn't actually increase your chance to hit, which was something that confused me about the feat when I first read it. You get an extra 5 damage if you manage to hit, whereas Greater Weapon Fighter allows you to add 10 more damage to all of your attacks without requiring special maneuvering on the battlefield or giving up your multi-attack at the cost of just a negative 5 penalty to the chance on hit. And that's one of the main problems with Charger, is that it basically eliminates your ability to multi-attack since it forces you to use your action for the dash, and then gives you a special bonus action created by this feat that only allows you to perform one attack. So unless you build your character around this feat, it's not very good. And that's not a very good feat to build your character around in the first place, as most melee classes need to take the attack action in order to attack multiple times. Although there are some melee classes that only attack a single time anyway, so this isn't that big of a deal, like maybe a rogue for example who just wants to get all their sneak attack damage in, or if the charger allowed you to dash as a bonus action then it would be a lot better. There is one little interesting interaction with it, is that for the second part of this feat, which requires you to move in a straight line for 10 feet, if you use the shove action, which is an actual thing players can use and an option similar to the grapple, where it has its own special rules and conditions for its use, is that shove can be used to either push a character 5 feet away or knock a character prone, assuming you win the contest of strength. And the way the charger feed is worded implies that you're using the shove action in order to use the part which allows you to knock a target 5 feet away, in which case they're knocked 10 feet away instead. But actually, you don't need to choose that option. You can just choose the prone option and still have the move 10 feet away from you, which will allow you to knock someone prone into a setup mage's firewall so it's hard for them to get her out, or to knock someone prone off a cliff so it's harder for them to save themselves. And at number 3, we have Skilled. This feat simply allows you to gain proficiency in any three combinations of your skills or tools of choice. There are 18 skills in the game and a handful of useful tools, so if literally no one else in your party has proficiency in thieves tools in order to unlock doors, then this would be a way to grab it without having to multi-class to rogue, although you can gain that through backstory options as well. So even then, it's not really needed, but that's kind of the reason why this feat exists just in case you really need a proficiency in something for whatever reason. It's more like a necessary evil. You're trading off two ASIs for proficiency in something your group probably really needs. Now, what's the problem with this skill if it has a clear and intended use? Well, most people build their characters with proficiencies they want in mind, and you get all kinds of proficiencies in the character creation process from your class, race, and your background. So one of the few useful things that your background actually provides you is extra proficiencies. It's only really useful if you're trying to do a skill monkey build, or a build where you're trying to get proficient in everything. And even then, it's not actually useful because that's a gimmick build. Unless you like playing gimmick builds. I personally love playing them, but I don't pretend that they're good. And funny thing about Skilled is that in Xanadar's Guide to Everything, they did release a new feat called Prodigy, which is basically a better version of Skilled, but can only be taken by three races. And what Prodigy does is it allows you to gain proficiency in three things, basically, where you get to pick a skill and tool to gain proficiency in, and also get to learn one language, which technically isn't a proficiency, but it is still a useful third thing to pick. So right out the gate, Prodigy basically has the same benefits as skill, but it also has a second effect, where you get to choose one of your proficiencies and then gain expertise in that skill which allows you to add double your proficiency bonus to any ability check you make with it. So, not only do you get to gain a whole bunch of proficiencies, you also get the all-important expertise, which is kind of hard to get normally, which makes Prodigy just a power-cramped version of Skilled. And even then, it's not taken very often. So, if the stronger version isn't picked up very often, even though it can be picked up by some of the most played races in the game, that should tell you a little bit about how weak the normal Skilled feat is. And at number 2, we have Savage Attacker. This is another feat kind of like Charger, which is supposed to give you extra damage so it doesn't give you any stat points, which ironically makes it very bad, and kind of a trap feat because it seems a lot more better on the surface. 
Basically, what it does is once per turn, you can reroll the damage for any one melee weapon attack. And only the damage dice of the melee weapon. So no sneak attack or smite rerolls or other magical effects that might be on the weapon which still do extra damage. Just the pure damage dice of the weapon. So a 1d12 if you're using a great axe, for example. Now, being able to reroll the damage dice and pick either one to use is a DPS increase. Although on average, it only gives you about one extra damage with the attack. A long sword deals 1d10 damage, or 5.5 damage on average. So being able to reroll and pick the highest will increase your average damage by about 1.65 to a total of 7.15. Now, if you were to take a plus two in strength, that would give you a plus one to your chance on hit and a plus one to all of your damage rolls. So if you were able to multi-attack, you immediately gain more advantage than taking the Savage Attacker feat. Not even including all the other bonuses you get for increasing your main stats. Just from a pure damage output of your weapon, if you have the ability to multi-attack, just picking an ASI will give you more damage. In fact, some people online have done the math, and the feat actually gets worse the more multi-attacks you get. To the point where at the end of the game, where you have the max amount of attacks for whatever class or spec, just taking the ASI will give you 250% more damage on average than Savage Attacker. And not only this, taking Savage Attacker just kind of slows down combat a little bit, because you get to choose which weapons you want to reroll. So every time you roll a bad damage dice, you could sit there for a second to decide if you want to reroll or not. It's not automatic. So unless you just really love to gamble or only attack a single time per turn with a really hard hitting weapon, as his feat is actually really bad if you have a low attack weapon, like a dagger, then it's still not really worth taking. Unless your ASI points are already maxed out and you only care about increasing your damage and already have all the other much better feats that also increase your damage. In which case, this would definitely increase your damage a little bit further. And at number one, we have Grappler. This is a feat that can only be taken if you have a strength score of 13 or higher, and gives you two benefits. You have advantage in attack rolls against creatures that you're grappling, and it gives you a special action where, if you're already grappling a creature, you can use your action to perform a special pin action, which allows you to apply the restrain condition to both you and the target of your grapple, until the grapple ends. And funny enough, this feat used to also have a third benefit, which stated that creatures that are one size larger than you do not automatically succeed grapple checks. Which was removed because that's not actually a rule. So its third benefit was just removed in a future errata because it was basically useless. Now what grapple does is it just reduces the speed of the target to zero. And if they want to get ungrappled, they have to use their action to perform the escape action. So it's useful for stopping fleeing enemies and can be done as part of your multi-attack. As you're allowed to replace one of your attacks with the grapple action as part of your multi-attack. So if you're a melee character and you have the multi-attack, you're only attacking with one handed weapon, you can grapple with your first attack. And if you have this feat, you would have advantage on all your other attacks for that turn, which definitely could be a benefit of this. Now, the pin action granted from this feat technically counts as the grapple action as well, so it can be substituted in for another one of your multi-attacks. So you can attempt to grapple and then pin them on the same turn. You can also grapple and then shove someone on the same turn in order to use its second option to knock them prone, which will give everyone advantage on the target within five feet without having to take a feat. So the shove action is just kind of better, since it essentially does the same thing for melee characters without requiring a special feat. Although some advantages to the restrain over the prone, the restrain condition gives advantage on range attacks, whereas the prone condition gives disadvantage to range attacks. So if you have a full party of ranged attackers, it's much better to have the target restrained than prone. Although even then, I'm not sure if you want to take a feat just to give advantage to all your party's ranged attack rolls on a single target while giving up all of your attacks for it. So if the shove action is just kind of already a thing that gives a lot of the same benefits as the pin action, the only real benefit of grappler is that it allows you to have advantage on your attack rolls as long as you grapple something. However, here's the thing about the shove action as well. It requires the same exact checks as grapple. So you could just use that to knock a target prone and then gain advantage on them since you'd be in melee range to accomplish both of these things anyway. And the shove action doesn't require you to have a free hand. So both of the benefits of this can be kind of accomplished by just using the shove action instead, which is why this feat makes it number one on this list. At least Tavern Brawler gives you the ability score improvement and allows you to try grapple as a bonus action, 
Whereas, the grappler feat doesn't actually give you any advantages to succeed on your grapple or allow you to use it easier. It's just if you manage to grapple someone, then you get extra benefits which aren't much better than using the shove action to knock someone prone. Alright, and that's the list. If you think I miss any other worse feats than the ones that I list in this video, or have ideas for future videos just like this one, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments.